So welcome everyone to this virtual panel on the challenges to patient care and patient experience that we are facing across the healthcare system today. Uh, I'm Stephen Morales, I'm a Managing Director uh, with Optimity Advisors. We are a full service consultancy that works with providers and payers to improve patient experience uh, across the entire spectrum of patient care. I'm joined, uh, pleased to be joined today by uh, two leading CEOs in the Chicago market, uh, Karen Teitelbaum, uh, the outgoing CEO of Sinai Chicago, uh, and Brenda Wolf, uh, the CEO of La Rabita Children's Hospital. Our discussion today is going to center on how the, this pandemic has really driven changes to the way in which your hospitals uh, and partners have had to modify their approaches to patient experience and some of the changing expectations that you may have seen uh, among providers, patients, and caregivers. Um, so, so thank you both, uh, of course, for taking the time out of your challenging schedule. Um, before we begin, though, I, I'm sure the, the um, attendees would love to understand a little bit more about your hospitals and what you see as the, the biggest impact the pandemic has had on delivery of care to date. So, so Brenda, maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to you to start. Um, just tell us a little bit about La Rabita Children's Hospital and uh, your experience. Of course, I always love to have an opportunity to talk about La Rabita, so thank you. We're what's called the Specialty Children's Hospital, and we serve a specialized population of children and also offer very specific services. We serve kids with lifelong medical conditions, disabilities, kids who are dependent on medical technology, kids who've experienced severe trauma. And we really view ourselves as a complement to the major healthcare providers in, the, in our community. Uh, we provide inpatient transitional care services from NICUs and PICUs for kids with, again, who are stable enough to leave the ICU, but not yet ready to go home. We have specialty services for kids with sickle cell disease, diabetes, cerebral palsy, and we're also a patient-centered medical home for 4,000 children uh, with special health care needs. But really what sort of envelops the entire operation is that we know and understand that families of kids with special needs and the kids themselves need a lot more than just good medical care. And we are committed to providing those services, whether it's education, whether it's nutrition, whether it's social work, whether it's car seats, uh, whether it's behavioral health, various therapy services, and I could go on and on, but I know we're not here to just hear about La Arbita. but that's really the overarching approach to the care we deliver. Uh, the other thing I have to always tell people is that we are the most Medicaid-reliant hospital in the state of Illinois, where about 90% of our revenues, patient revenues, come from the Medicaid program. But I also always say to people, if you're going to be that high, you might as well be number one. Uh, <laughs> the, the pandemic. The pandemic has been an interesting time for all of us, right? Um, I think in a way, one thing is in, it's brought out both the best and worst in people. And obviously, as a, a leader of an organization, we've had to identify how we help and support our workforce and our families and our friends, but also how to use rigor in making decisions to be able to keep on moving forward. The other thing that um, we, we're going to talk about a little later is, you know, the whole use of tel telehealth, virtual healthcare services. That's I keep on telling people that is probably the best thing that COVID ever did because it really pushed us all to evolve in that way in a much more um, uh, quick fashion. And the last thing that COVID has really done for us or we've learned from is when we had to sit down to really think about the ways that we needed to protect our patients, our families, and our staff in terms of infection prevention. It was a really an eye-opening experience about how we operated um, in general, not so much about going into a patient's room and watch, washing your hands, but about sort of the entire operation in terms of access to our inpatient unit and, and such. And we, learn, I think, really have learned a lot about that and now have really been working on how to really not just make that an add-on, but really looking at how um, you can adopt these practices on an ongoing basis. So that's what I'm going to say as a beginning. 
Thanks. That, that's a great, great starting point. Uh, Karen, why tell us a little bit about the Sinai Health System? Uh, thanks, Stephen, and thanks so much for inviting us today. Um, you know, I, I do have to start with just noting uh, what an asset La Rabita is to uh, really to all of Illinois and certainly to Chicago. You heard just a little snippet of, uh, and, and I'm not here to advertise Brenda, but I just have <laughs> to say it. That's okay. Healthcare. Keep on going. We're all friends. We're all friends. As a healthcare colleague, um, really just an unbelievable uh, facility providing care, I think, to a population that's most needed. So Sinai Chicago. So Sinai Chicago is on the west side and the southwest side of Chicago. We are the largest private safety net in Chicago. Um, we are 103 years old, started with the same mission of taking care of vulnerable communities 103 years ago, and we're still doing that today. Uh, we are a level one trauma center. We're a level three neonatal intensive care unit, so the highest levels of technical care in those areas. We have one of only two freestanding rehab facilities as one of our four hospitals, one of only two in Chicago that are freestanding. We have, uh, we're a pretty big employer on the west side. We've got 3,200 caregivers. Um, we have a medical group uh, that we employ. It's primarily specialists because we get our primary care, um, again, primarily through our um, uh, federally qualified healthcare partners. Um, what's different about uh, Sinai Chicago though, I think is that we have a research institute that houses uh, community health workers and epidemiologists doing uh, translational research in health disparities out in the community. And then we have a community institute that has about uh, 12 to 14 um, programs uh, that are relevant for our communities. Um, for example, a workforce development um, uh, program. We have a delaying subsequent pregnancy uh, in teenage girls. We have an elder abuse hotline. So wide variety of programs. We are, even though Brenda's number one, we are 60% Medicaid. Um, we are 20% uh, Medicare. And, and just to be clear, we are not a children's hospital, though we have a fully accredited, fully accredited uh, children's hospital, but it's not a freestanding one like La Robita. Um, We are 20% Medicare. We have about 12% absolutely no pay. And then the rest little bit is commercial insurance. Um, we serve a very dense population in Chicago. It's a service area of about 1.5 million people. So essentially one out of every three uh, Chicagoans um, are in the, the communities that we serve. And they're challenged communities. Um, we have uh, seven times the unemployment rate as the rest of Chicago. And that was pre-COVID. So you can imagine what it's like now. Uh, one out of every four people report post-traumatic stress disorder from being a victim of violence or seeing violence. One out of every two people in our communities reports food insecurity, and we have a high burden of chronic disease. So uh, challenging communities, but you know, again, lots of opportunities to impact the health in Chicago. And Stephen, the question about the biggest impact, you know, I was thinking about this for today, and I just keep coming back to, I know we're going to talk about a lot of aspects of care, so I'm going to hold, you know, many of the other comments we're going to cover, but I just keep thinking about the level of ex exhaustion on, on the, the part of our caregivers, who, especially now with the labor shortage, um, people have been doing this for uh, going on two years now, and they're just exhausted and con still concerned about bringing the virus home. So th those are some of the things that we're thinking about how do we, and I know we're gonna get more into that, uh, but that for me is, is pretty much front and center these days. Yeah, that's, that's great. And maybe that's a great way to just continue on the conversation. So, you know, I think when, when we think about the impact uh, on the providers that are out there, the people who are on, on the front lines, um, I think in, in you know one of our previous discussions, you said this is this is really a human issue, right? That we're trying to um, solve for. So, so I'm curious, like from your position, like how have you tried to innovate on something like a human issue? Well, you know, Stephen, whenever we talk about um, innovation, my mind always goes to, well, it's got to be technology. And you know what? With this, um, this is going to sound just probably not very sexy and very simple, but um, I think it's I think it's human. It's about human support. It's about empathy. It's about compassion, and that's where we have to start. You know, early on, and, and Stephen and Brenda, I think I might have uh, shared this with you. Um, early on, we may all recall that in New York City, in an emergency department, there was a physician who, after doing many many shifts with COVID patients coming in and dying, uh, committed suicide herself. 
-hmm. And at Sinai Chicago, we really took that very seriously. We decided we were going to support our leaders in conversations and an assessment of our caregivers at risk. And every single department across our four hospitals and our um, institutes and our medical groups uh, were asked to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people to actually sit down, look them in the eye and say, how are you doing? How are you doing at home? How are you doing at work? And to just get a sense of, is this somebody who's going to need more support? Um, we also came to have a deeper understanding of what people really needed. Um, and it's interesting because all of us in healthcare remember you know, all the all the signs on the lawns, healthcare heroes work here, and there was food delivery after food delivery after food delivery for all of our shifts, right? Um, somebody at uh, in our community who runs a laundry offered to do laundry for our caregivers and said, after you get done caring for the rest of us, the last thing you should have to do is laundry. We also look for ways to be innovative about elder care, child care, and for our patients, of course, it's, it was a horrible uh, situation, still is, that people um, many times, and certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, couldn't be with their, with their families um, at the end of life. So making sure people had iPads, poor substitute, but making sure there was you know, a connection. And then finally, our chaplaincy, behavioral health, employee assistance program for all shifts 24 seven. And that still goes on today. That's interesting. Uh, Brenda, how about for you at La, La Rabita? So I'm going to sort of take this from a different angle and for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, our goal during all this, because we're not a an acute care facility in the true sense of the word, um, mm -hmm. our job was really more to keep our kids who are inpatients, our families and our employees safe. Um, you know, we're pretty proud of over the entire course of the entire COVID, we've had three patients with COVID, two right at the beginning, and one more recently whose mom visited her and brought it in. But um, this is also, but the, the tax on employees, employees being ill and then cover, complementing that with the workforce uh, shortage, we've really um, started to look at this in a little different way. You know, we can keep on talking about the uh, concrete things we can help employees with, but we've really started to take a look more at um, how we can be more interdisciplinary. And by being more interdisciplinary, we're also able to support each other um, more easily in that if we can break down the silos and oh, that there are things that a respiratory therapist can do, but a nurse can also do, or what does a CNA do versus what does a nurse do? And we've been really working and we continue to work on breaking down these silos. And we think that is helpful because it helps the workforce work with each other, but we really think that's a better way of delivering care to the patient, um, if there's less providers who can do more, not making them do extra, but it, it's going to be a better model of care. And we think in the long run, it is going to be a less expensive way of delivering care. So it's just something, you know, obviously we too have worked to try to support employees. Um, you know, the stress of uh, taking care of your own family, uh, patients, and then dealing with families who have so many issues, of course, is, you know, taxing, but we're really excited about this relooking at who does what in, you know, in the healthcare setting. I love that idea. Um, and I'd love to just get both of you to kind of uh, chime in on uh, a lot of times. I think what, what we're hearing um, around staffing shortages is that nurses you know, are, are jumping off, becoming traveling nurses, right, or, or other things. The, what you're kind of talking about, about bringing down the, um, the walls between different roles, does that, does that actually help with cohesion? I mean, do you feel like from both of your perspectives, this might be you know, a, a way to kind of work better together? Go ahead, Brenda. I was going to say, ultimately, yes. But I have to say, in some cases, people have been sort of ingrained into um, sort of these silos and what we, you know, and we see, you know, we have children who leave who are on ventilators who go home 
And mm -hmm. there is a nurse that comes into the home and the family delivers all this, these services. There is no respiratory therapist. Yeah. There are not all these other disciplines. And so we know that outside of the hospital, it can be done. So we are really working on making that happen. And actually, um, simultaneous to all this, we had begun, our inpatient unit is about 20 years old, and there were just a lot of things that we were looking at needing to kind of upgrade because of technology and things like that. But after this COVID has made us think about a bunch of other things to go along with it. One of the things we're doing is we're converting our whole area as the inpatient unit, and we're going to physically break down silos in the sense that there's going to be this one giant inpatient break area. And whether you're a nurse or a respiratory therapist or a physician, we're going to have a really lovely break area, but there's no reason that everybody has to have their own spaces. Or even in terms of, because the whole idea of what your workspace is, we're combining um, leaders of different disciplines in the same work area together. And so we're, going, we're trying to really live in, sort of breathe this in a, in a different way way. Um, and, you know, and COVID also, as I mentioned about, you know, infection prevention, we always had it that people got off the elevator and then walked halfway down the unit, you know, the nurse's station to say, hi, I'm here. Well, that is not a good way to, you know, make sure for both from patient safety and infection prevention. So we're redesigning access to the unit by having sort of a uh, welcoming area that you kind of have to go through before you can go see a patient. So we've really, COVID has really opened our eyes in that way about just making care different and better. And also for kids that are vulnerable that, to have a place for them to leave their rooms, but not have to leave the unit. So a lot of that thinking really came out of um, COVID. That's fantastic. Uh, Karen? Yeah, and you know, it's interesting um, because our environment is very different than Brenda's environment. You know, we've got two campuses and many ambulatory sites and, and given the complexity of the care that we offer, um, it can be, and, and we're also teaching, we're a teaching institution. So at any one time, we've got 100 medical students running around, we've got residents and nine different programs. Um, so it can be very chaotic. And then you toss on top of this, how many times we needed to, there's a surge and we need to pivot and we need to change a unit to, to house patients temporarily. I mean, anybody watching who's in healthcare, you know, has probably gone through this. And so um, I'm, I'm thinking about this and, uh, you know, Brenda, it's almost like uh, diametrically opposed to what you just described, <laughs> that at some point people need a routine. They need some stability you know, at least I see that in our organization. So while we are not to the degree that you are, which I think is great, uh, crossing the functional lines, it makes all the sense in the world. Um, we're trying to build in some stability, some routine, so that it's one thing. I think that people um, become uh, overwhelmed when they feel that they don't have control over their environment. If we know one thing about this pandemic, I mean, nobody yeah. has control. So we're trying to, you know, maybe put a little bit of a fencing around that to give our caregivers um, more of a more of a steady routine mm -hmm. on on what we can. And I think it's it's interesting to to think about you know the highly specialized versus you know obviously as a trauma as a uh, level one trauma center that you have you see so many different things, but it, it suggests there may be different ways to potentially address this. Um, maybe Brenda, you know, I'll kind of go back to you because I, I do, well, I do want to eventually come back to this idea of how we see things from the, from the provider's perspective, which I think is really fantastic. Um, I do want to continue, uh, continue a little bit on, on the theme of innovation, right? And you talked, uh, uh, talked a little bit about iPads. You talked about, you know, the outside the hospital. Um, can you talk to me a lot what kind of innovations Lara has put in place to kind of get those patients, um, their caregivers, comfortable once they, once they leave um, La Robita? Well, um, so I'll, I'll sort of move a little bit towards, you know, telehealth. And we obviously all, anyone that has any uh, physician and clinic type services, you know, we all rapidly morphed into telehealth. And then our behavioral health services were also easily morphing into telehealth. And 
I have to say that COVID probably helped us do that in a much more quickly, quick fashion than if we had just said this is a good thing to do because we would have had a bunch of committees and we would have interviewed a lot of vendors and people would have had different opinions. And this way we just had to do it. But obviously that was simple. Um, and then we sort of kept on moving and innovating. So we were able to deliver a considerable amount of physical occupation and speech therapy services through telehealth. Uh, what we did was through philanthropy is we procured supplies and equipment and sent them to our families' homes. So they would have the therapy ball or the crayons or whatever the therapist would primarily use. And then they were able to deliver services. So that was our first sort of, I mean, we, we weren't the only ones, but that was a big step forward to think about that delivery. But we've be, um, begun to use, tel first of all, we're really trying to say telehealth is part of the care continuum. It isn't that you do this instead of, but that there are certain visits that should be and certain that should be face-to-face -face and so on. But we've also used it to help um, uh, have a warm handoff when we, since all, most of our inpatients are referred to us, we now do telehealth transfers where the, um, the, the child's at the referring hospital in their current room, the team that has been delivering care for the child at the referring hospital is in the room, parents are in the room if they choose to be, and our team is at the other end. And even though there's been phone conversations and charts have been reviewed. This is a real warm handoff between caregivers. And it has really, and we do it a day before transfer and then we do it a couple of days after the child is here. So it goes both ways, but it's been a great way to really get into the nuances of care. But the other things that are so useful, that often when a child gets transferred to a lower level of care, the current caregivers, don't think it's possible that anyone could do it as well as they have. Um, we do. We see that when we discharge a child, this is the caregivers really getting an opportunity to meet each other, talk to each other, see the child in both settings. It's also a great way to just develop working relationships with referrers. So we're pretty excited about that. And then we've also use telehealth, you know, our, our uh, case managers have always called families after discharge. We're now really using telehealth as a way to do a follow-up, even if the child doesn't remain with us for ongoing care, um, to do actually a telehealth visit. It's also mm -hmm. so helpful to see actually the home environment. So it isn't just having a call and saying, is everything okay? We can ask where did you put this piece of equipment? Do you have enough supplies? Um, you know, his position seems a little off. Maybe you should do this or that. So it's really helped um, open our eyes. And some of our, we have a clinic for kids who are dependent on technology and the whole team meets with the family with their child at home. And it's just been so helpful in really, you know, even though we're not touching each other in a way people are closer. That's very interesting. Yeah. Karen? I'm going to just talk for a moment about um, impactful partnerships. Um, I said at, uh, when we first started that one out of every two people in our communities reported food insecurity. And, and we know that during the pandemic, that was just exacerbated. And I happened to be talking with the then CEO of uh, Sodexo, who's a partner of ours in uh, food services and, others, and other services at the hospital. And uh, before I knew it, we were suddenly um, partnering with a trucking company from another state that was going to bring us hundreds of pallets of thousands of meals for community pickup. Okay. And that's exactly what happened. And so for, uh, for hours on end, on uh, over two days, we had community members coming in uh, thanks to that partnership. Um, that's something that's not gonna be solved by tech, hunger is not gonna be solved by technology, right? Um, same thing with uh, some of our smaller businesses in the North Lawndale area and the Pilsen Little Village area, the communities that we serve. Um, they did not necessarily have access to protective equipment, um, didn't have the resources. They don't typically have a, an education department about how do you bring people into the business or into work safely. Um, so we partnered with those businesses to help the community in terms of those areas. And we're, whereas we um, fortunately 
received many, many donations of, um, of uh, safe um, protective equipment. Yeah. Uh, we were able to share that with our community. And then when the vaccination came, uh, we pivoted to vaccines. We had a mobile van, we went into the community. We're talking a little bit about this, I think before, before we started yeah. this uh, webinar. Um, we were at the barber shops, we were at the gas stations. Um, we were engaging the community leaders, whether it's faith-based, we had performance artists, we actually had distance dance parties. But these were the kinds of innovative things that we um, put into place externally to um, really engage the community around education and vaccine and, and how to live day to day safely, um, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic. And then with uh, technology, we have community health workers. We've been using them for 20 years before there even was such a, you know, such a profession. And our community health workers, of course, have always done their work going into the home to assess the home environment and do education. And we had to pivot to using um, iPads and to using technology in that way, uh, similar to telehealth, but um, doing a lot of um, communication, teaching, and then also coordination of care through our community health workers, um, but using technology. So, so let me continue on the idea of teaching, right? Because I think there's a, the common theme sort of between you know, both of what you said um, you know, from Brenda's perspective, like get, you know, seeing the home environment, teaching, you know, is the, do you actually have the play, things in the right place? Um, but also I'm very fascinated, Karen, when we think about the um, going out to the community and, and doing these you know, distance dance parties, things that seem very social, but may actually smooth the pathway to having that education, because it, let's be honest, it, the education, health literacy levels in underserved communities or just communities in general is very low, right? So when you think about some, some of the future um, patient experiences that are gonna be out there, do we think that hospitals are going to have to do some more of that social support that's going to enable the education? Oh, you know, that's that's like lobbing a softball at me, <laughs> because honestly, like I am such a believer in this and, and that's what Sinai has been all about. Um, you know, we talk a lot about community health workers and, and what I love about that program is that um, I mentioned our high unemployment rate. And, you know, if people don't have a steady income and they don't have a safe and reliable place to live, they don't care about coming in for their mammogram, right? They don't care about coming in for their annual physical. That is low on the, the need hierarchy. Um, so this whole idea about taking people from the community, training them, educating them in chronic disease, or in this case, vaccine education, and then turning them back to the commute to their own communities as community health workers. I think that that is a huge part of our future. So it's always been part of Sinai. But we've seen the impact that having people from the communities, and while we're doing that, we're getting at that unemployment rate, um, giving people jobs with good benefits, including health benefits. Um, so I think that's got to be, you know, some of the, the changes that we're putting in because of the pandemic um, are, are just going to be sustainable and enduring, and it's going to be a better delivery system. But um, I'm, I'm a big believer in working with the community in everything that we do. Fantastic. Yeah. Bre Brenda, I mean, what, are you, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, you're trying to, trying to get out more socially to... Well, you know, it's, it is complicated. And, you know, as Karen was talking about the community workers, you know, there's all these new terms like social determinants of health and uh, care coordination. And I think some of us who've been in the safety net world for a long time, um, this is really sort of part of our DNA and has always been part of our DNA. And it's only sort of recently, I hate to say this, become more sexy. Um, and, <laughs> and everyone has suddenly realized that this is important. Now we still need to get the healthcare reimbursement system to recognize that as well, but we'll have to do another webinar to, you know, yeah, to, talk, <laughs> <laughs> to talk about that. But, um, the community, you can, it's impossible to do this work without understanding the community. Our community maybe is a little different because our swath is wider and we're more um, 
sort of focused on a subpopulation, but without understanding the the needs. And, you know, we had talked before, you know, the big aha moment we had here was about diapers. Um, because um, between COVID and the George Floyd murder and the, you know, shutdown of retail, um, it we really discovered our families had access issues, but also, and I never understood this, I guess diapers, if you have a child with a, who's older and has disabilities, Medicaid will cover that. But for a, a regular, typical family, diapers are not covered by any reimbursement social programs. And I even did a little research, only in the state of California do they have a program that reimburses families for diapers. That is a huge need for a family, getting them, but having the resources to pay for them. And one of the things which is sort of off this, but our own workforce here um, did, did a huge diaper drive. And we collected the equivalent either through dollars or actual diapers, 100,000 diapers, just to be able to give them out to families that needed that. But it's just one of those, you, you cannot deliver care. And I would say, we can talk about this later, whether it's a low income world or just a typical the rest of the world without really thinking about the community and life outside of just the healthcare setting. The health, yeah, that's actually a perfect, perfect way to kind of describe that. Um, I, I do wanna maybe shift a, a little bit uh, to talking specifically around digital innovations. Um, you know, and, and I imagine that you, you, you talk, both talked about iPads, um, but you probably considered like bigger things. Um, like uh, there are a lot of you know interesting innovations out there for you know translation or or you know engagement um, in different parts of uh, the patient journey. Um, you know, for safety net hospitals, you know, in the CEO role, how do you weigh spending money on a new technology like that versus some of the stuff that we're talking about, the, yeah. sort of the, the bread and butter? You know, it's it's interesting um, because safety nets are constantly choosing where we're going to allocate our scarce capital dollars, and this is where philanthropy is vital. Um, also, you know, partnerships, uh, city, state, federal support. Uh, we don't have the luxury that many hospitals uh, have had in terms of um, being able to readily budget for and deploy. Uh, so. <clears throat> The pandemic did push us into telehealth, which I think is Brenda, Brenda did such a good job of describing all the positives and how we're all going to continue doing that. Something a little bit, you know, in my mind, even before that, um, at a more basic level, our Sinai Community Institute is working with Microsoft and our North Lawndale uh, Community Coordinating Council, which is a, a grouping of uh, community organizations in the North Lawndale neighborhood to expand and improve internet. Doesn't do us any good to have this telehealth if on the other end, the patient does not have reliable internet. So Microsoft's been a fantastic partner with us recognizing how vital that um, stable uh, internet is for health, for education, socialization, just as important. Um, but it just hasn't always been available consistently for our community. So, you know, we, we depend a lot on our, um, uh, I call them our investors, our philanthropists and, and our foundation partners to enable us to pick and choose and prioritize uh, where to spend that money. We'll come back to uh, Brenda, how about, how about for Laura Bita? Well, again, you know, we're very small and we're very specialized. So we kind of support the notion of others sort of trying things first and then we adopting them because we're not a good beta, you know, not a really a good beta site even, but we do, you know, work with other organizations to be able to move us forward. Both uh, Larbita and Sinai are part of the Medical Home Network and Affordable Care Organization. And this is relates more to our outpatient uh, uh, delivery, but through that, that organization, there's been efforts afoot to again, um, link uh, technology so that, you know, you can't live in a, a silo again, you can have your own medical record, but if you don't have the information about what happened to the patient when they went to somebody else's emergency room or uh, were admitted to another hospital without having that cohesive amount of information, it, it just doesn't work. And you know, this is just, this is not a plug. I always felt one of the 
mistakes when we went to quote meaningful use in the whole EHR world and the federal government invested all that money, they should have mandated that the systems had to speak to each other. And instead now everybody is investing to make them speak to each other because there were almost like were barriers set up so that everybody would maybe purchase one particular product. I, that's just yeah. a, an editorial comment that's there. <laughs> but uh, um, but it, it is, you just have to keep on thinking about, you know, every aspect of a person's life and access to whether it is, uh, the internet or having the devices or just, just about anything. And, and then so, I mean, such a great comment though, because inter interoperability is such a huge issue, right? Uh, everywhere in the, in the hospital, just getting information from even within the hospital, one place to another. Um, but I, I think the couple people on our, our, uh, our call today are, are very interested to understand. So if you, so if you have a new technology, right? And, and you as a CEO are, are trying to say, Hey, this can, this can help you. Uh, is the best way to try to deploy it or get engagement with it, you know, to a patient who's coming into your ED? Is it to a patient who's getting discharged from your hospital? Is it to a patient that is not even, you know, coming to the hospital at all? Um, and like, you know, try to engage them socially and say, hey, you know, you should really use this. It'll help keep you out of the hospital. But what are your thoughts on those sort of three options? Yes. <laughs> and I was just going to say all of the above. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, uh, with the emergency department, of course, you have to get people stabilized before they're going to be able to listen to anything, right? So we put our community health workers on the back end of the visit as people are getting ready to be discharged. We are then, you know, from the emergency department and with the patient assessing, is, do you have a safe place to go home to? Do you have what you need when you get home? And uh, that would be a place at which if we were going to engage around some kind of digital technology, um, that would be the place where we would do it. On the other hand, we've got, as I've talked about, people really out in the community as we've been doing since 1919, working with the community. Um, we feel very strongly that we don't do things for the community or to the community, but we really partner with the community. Because one of the things we have to think about um, is it's not just, I and mean, Brenda did such a great job of describing, you know, the need for like hospital to hospital to the healthcare systems to talk to each other. We also feel like we've got to talk to the, um, the homeless shelters and we've got to talk to the food pantries and we've got to talk to, you know, the other uh, behavioral health units out in the community. So we try to think about it in a more global sense. What are all the things that touch the community? And where are the points of intersection for that connection, as opposed okay. to just hospital to hospital? Well, that's totally, you know, table stakes. And we've got to do that. Very interesting. Um, Brenda, anything you, you want to add to that? No, I think Karen's done a great job and, you know, Sinai has been a leader in this and, you know, you know, it, it's a credit to Sinai because, you know, as a safety net, they have many challenges, but they see the critical nature of engaging the community in so many different ways. And of course, uh, you know, again, being a children's provider, you know, the schools play such a critical role in all this and, you know, that's one of the other areas, not so much from a technology perspective, but we spend a lot of time assisting our families um, in dealing with their children and their schools, whether it's teaching a teacher how to take care, knowing that a child has a chronic condition, but making sure kids are in the right school placement and uh, families are empowered to advocate for their kids in the school setting. So, you know, it really does take a village and uh, you, you can't function just as a, you know, an institution with four walls. That's very well said. Um, and I do want to, as we're kind of reaching into the, uh, the last 20 minutes here, um, I want to encourage people, if they have any questions, please to enter them into either the chat or the uh, Q&A. Um, so we'll, we'll be able to take those questions. Um, but, but Brenda, maybe I'll, I'll just continue on with you. Um, as we think about uh, for hospitals and systems, like, you know, there, there are some partners out there that you, you I'm sure, undoubtedly work with who, who really kind of stepped up to the plate to help you meet the needs uh, around patient experience uh, during the pandemic. And so I'm just curious which types of partners you think have really kind of shown you know, through during the pandemic and, and which ones do you feel like have, have some room for improvement? 
Well, that's a difficult question. I mean, you know, uh, we can go back. You know, I was thinking about partners or the pandemic, and I remember when the Blue Angels flew over um, Chicago to thank healthcare workers. You know, but but um, it's it's in so many different ways, and Karen really articulated it. Whether it was you know food or you know. Uh, at one point, you know, people were making cloth masks for us. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we've we've evolved. Um, people, I'm not sure where they found it, but bringing us PPE that they had for whatever reason. I don't want to know why, but I mean, obviously, we made sure they were, you know, safe. But I mean, yeah. it it's it's at every level. Even our board, you know, uh, made sure that they recognized our employees and you know fed them. But it also is partners just supporting us in, you know, whether it's our um, the supply chain to make sure that we have what we need and understanding how, you know, we can't pay five times the cost of a uh, whatever, whatever it is. So it's it's it really does. I mean, it don't make me trite, but it does take a village and it just um, just takes a lot of different types of organizations and people. And also just somebody reaching out and asking, how are you, we personally are doing, or what can they do to, to help us? I just think that is so critical. And that goes with government as well. I'll just tell a quick story. Um, when the initial dollars came out for, from the federal government to support healthcare providers, um, the first lab that the federal government took to do that was to use Medicare as the way to gauge, um, you know, how to reimburse the hospitals. Well, if you're a children's hospital, if you have Medicare, it's because of a really odd thing, either because you're doing dialysis or because you have a child that has a parent that is on Medicare. So our first check that we received from the federal government was like $19.90. Sense, and it was sort of. It, I mean, it would have been better to get zero. Um, and I'll never forget the a bunch of the hospitals were on a call with Senator Durbin, and I mentioned that to him. And it was like I couldn't see him because of the phone call, but I know there was fire in his eyes, and he really then became a hero. And it wasn't just for Lara Vita, but for any exclusive children's provider of going back to um, you know, the Department of Health and Human Services to say, you cannot just use Medicare as your uh, way to gauge reimbursements. The easiest, because it's a federal program. But so it really takes all different kinds of people to help you get through um, crisis situations. Uh, wonderful said. Karen? Yeah, Brent, I, I never heard you tell that story. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so something Brenda said made me think about this. Uh, I think that a lot of people in Chicago probably don't know. We're talking about collaboration, coordination um, in the healthcare uh, field. And um, from March till June, uh, eight uh, hospital CEOs in Chicago and the City Department of Public Health, and we were joined um, routinely by the Illinois Department of Public Health, Sometimes the mayor hopped onto the call, um, but uh, three times a week in the evening, we would be calling to coordinate all aspects of dealing with the, um, talk about partnership, all aspects of dealing with the, um, with the pandemic uh, in the city. It was everything from, uh, you know, setting, uh, advising on setting up the field hospital at McCormick, to looking at uh, capacity, whether it's bed capacity, ventilator capacity. And, you know, remember this was March of 2020. This is when we started doing it. And it was one of the reasons why I felt a lot of, um, I, I, I felt that we were in good hands. I felt that, you know, there was uh, that kind of communication that needed to happen that that foresight of planning. Remember, we never reached the point that uh, California, Washington, or New York reached. For one reason or another, we were ahead. So I think you talk about partnerships in the pandemic. That was, you know, that was certainly one that for me was very, very important. I think it was important for all of us in the city. And then, you know, I've talked a bit about um, I've talked a bit about the partnerships outside and and 
one of the things that that we've done through Sinai Urban Health Institute, which is our research institute, we did um, the largest door to door survey in English and Spanish um, that Chicago has ever had. It was funded by Chicago Community Trust. And we didn't just come up with the 500 questions. We had our community members give us input. Not a single question got on that survey of 500 questions unless the community deemed it relevant to the community. It didn't matter if we wanted to know it. This was for the community. And from that, we were able to shape, you know, what were the priorities of the community and then who needed to be around the table because it was coming directly from our communities. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I, I think the, the clear theme here, right, is that the innovation has to come from not only people you're serving, but the communities that you're you're working with, right? And you know, listening, listening and learning is you know is really the the thing that has to be done. Um, you know, I, I'm wondering though, you know, because you're both in in such a, an interesting position because of, because of the heavy reliance on Medicaid. Um, do you have any um, any lessons? Like, so if you know, if you, I'm sure you, you sit down with your peers at um, hospitals like you know uh, Northwestern, you know University of Chicago, where they have like a, a very different payer mix. You know, what do you think that you've learned out of this pandemic that they need to they need to know? Well, we love our colleagues, um, but I I don't know that either one of them have called. They haven't called me lately. Have they called you? <laughs> no, but I when when we talked about this before, so I thought about this, and so. Um, I have a background both in special education and marketing, and I kind of look at everything from this marketing lens. And whether you have, you know, mostly insured patients or you have low income patients, whatever it is, you just always have to look at who your audience is. And, um, and, and I, you know, I don't know if that's a safety net thing, but we've tried to really drill that into our workforce. And I think that's something that I think I've learned more so during COVID than I ever did before. And so it, it doesn't matter. It's just, you've got to look at who you're talking to. And we've recently, you know, we have a trauma program that does long and short-term counseling for kids who've been severely traumatized, but we also have done um, trauma and for form care training to community organizations and other organizations, but we've also begun doing it within the hospital. And we view that through that lens because, you know, the trauma-informed care is really looking at the traumatized person and it doesn't have to be direct trauma. It can just be living in, you know, segregated communities and, you know, low-income communities, but it's that lens and looking at how you talk to a family member, no matter who you are working at the hospital, looking at treating a patient, but also how you treat each other. Mm -hmm. And um, somehow that to me, although this whole trauma-informed uh, approach really comes from these communities who have had so many issues, I think that's really applicable to any healthcare provider. And it's a sort of very rewarding to me to see our workforce sort of um, embarking on that. And I think that would be helpful to any organization. All right. Wonderful. Well, that's great. Uh, so we did have a couple of questions that, that came through, um, you know, and I'd love to, um, uh, there was a question here, you know, when you think about the, the patient experience before the person even becomes uh, a patient, right? So you, you're obviously um, just members of the community. You know, who do you rely on to really shoulder that that burden of influencing community health um, and patient experience? I think you, you talked a little bit about you know barber shops and going to gas stations, but who, who's the who's the partner there that that can can really help? Well, you know, I think in our uh, in our communities, I think uh, the faith based leaders have been amazing. We've had a series before COVID came. We had a regular um, series of uh, ministry breakfasts. Uh, to talk about the issues that are in the community and, and to kind of share best practices and, and almost like playbooks of how do we make sure that the congregations are, um, are being served and, and are being healthy. I think the other thing for me, and I'll, I'll go back to the community health workers because I am such a believer in this. Um, you know, I always say if I went knocking on a door in the community to talk to one of our community residents about diabetes, I kind of think 
you know, if I was talking to teenage girls about delaying subsequent practice, nobody's going to be listening to me. But yeah. when we've got trusted members of the community that are, you know, they live next door and they're saying, hey, do you know about, or, you know, I, I know five of your kids have asthma. Do you have, do you have inhalers for everybody? More often than not, we're finding that, well, no, mom only has three inhalers and the kids are taking turns. It's like Russian roulette, right? Um, mm -hmm. Hope I don't have the attack today. So, I think just figuring out um, how to how to really relate with the community, not to the community, but with the community, and what assets do we already have in the community that we could leverage and rely on, um, not coming from the hospital, but actually activating those already in the community. Excellent. Um, if, and you know, Brenda, you're, you're in a unique situation as a specialty children's hospital. But um, you know, did, does the special children's hospital actually do outreach to the community? Well, we, you know, everybody here would like to do everything, and we try to yeah. say, you know, we've got to kind of focus on, you know, who we are and what we do. So our community is probably different than when you think about it. Our community might be we call them DOVAs, disease-oriented voluntary associations. So there's like a, a sickle cell association. There's a couple of diabetes associations. There are the special ed programs in the school systems. So we kind of more focus on those entities as our community to kind of identify because they've already identified. Um, individuals of interest and often parents of children that have these conditions. And that's sort of our target more than just the community at large. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we try to grapple with that because it is, yeah. you know, it is complicated um, and we can't be all things to all people. How are you trying to realistically address the problem to improve access to care and improve quality of care to the black community? Yeah, so let me, let me, answer that one first. Um, so remember up, up top in the webinar, I said that we, we uh, employ primarily specialists. So we don't have a huge number of primary care out there um, from which we're, we're submitting data on preventive health care. We are seeing the patient, th those, those patients are being seen in, with our partners in federally qualified health centers that are not part of Sinai. Um, so, you know, the, the issue of preventive care in our community health workers, it's not the same as putting in claims data from a primary care doc. That just doesn't happen. We, by and large, don't get paid for our community health workers. So um, to Noel's question, we won't show up on anything that measures like that um, for preventive, equitable care. But what we do have are studies, for example, with our, our community health workers, um, that for every dollar we invest, we're saving $14 on the other end in uh, people not going to the emergency department. For um, breast health in our communities, um, we've been able to move through our community health workers and breast care navigators who are in the community where that, you know, the, the data doesn't get put into any kind of database that US News is gonna find, but we've been able to move um, the prevalence of stage four breast cancer, because people were waiting to come in until the lump was palpable, right? Um, they weren't coming in for a screening mammogram. We've been able to move through our programs. We've been able to reduce that and move it down to uh, stage one, stage two, where it's infinitely more treatable. So one thing I've learned of being at Sinai 15 years is that the care doesn't always get measured in like the US News and World Report or Consumer Reports or Leapfrog or anything like that, because we just do it, we're doing it outside the system, but we look at outcomes. And can I just add to that, because again, focus on kids and kids with special needs, you know, payers, even the government sort of operates on a year by year basis, you know, new dollars, new contracts, and many of the outcomes really, you've got to do it through the you know, not the lifespan, but certainly through a longer period of time. We talked about sickle cell kids. We have all these programs working on non-pharmaceutical ways to manage pain. And part of that is as you become an adult with sickle cell, 
Um, a lot of times when you show up in an emergency room, they think you're a drug seeker that they don't under because you don't look like you have a disease. Um, and we're trying to figure out ways that you may not need the medication. Or we have programs where we can um, avert having uh, orthopedic surgery and a child can walk rather than use a wheelchair or walker. But that isn't going to come out in one year's worth of data. And so a lot of this stuff really needs longitudinal, long-term um, research. And also to, so therefore those of us who are trying to be doing prevention, I always call it secondary prevention, so that we can actually get paid to do these things. Because when we do this work and it's called serial casting, we get paid like $250 for a visit to do this casting and it takes three staff, yet we're averting having orthopedic surgery which and the recovery associated with it. But there's no way that that gets measured. Um, so yeah. it's, it's challenging. It, it, it is challenging, it's, it's frustrating. And you know, um, to hop onto what Brenda's saying, we get paid more uh, to amputate a diabetic leg than I do to send a community health worker. I get paid nothing to send a community health worker to the home and get them into treatment and educate about diet and uh, and so on. And yet that's where we allocate our time and money. And I, and I think that's actually a perfect way to end because you know, when we think about the innovation, we you know, the theme here has been you know getting out to the community, right? And and, and doing the things that you're not necessarily uh, paid for in the health system as it's as it's set up. So uh, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you, you know, to both of you, uh, Karen and, and Brenda, uh, for sharing your insights on this. Um, you know, the web, uh, webinar is recorded, so you will, we'll definitely make it available uh, for others to see. But um, you know, thank you so much for um, taking the time out of your schedules, but also for helping us see what the what the great opportunities for innovation are going to be uh, going forward. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you.